Hello YouTube, I am Dr. Robyun. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students. Hope someone finds this helpful. Okay, now today's topic is Cell Injury Part 2. In the previous video of cell injury, we discussed the definition of cell injury, the common causes of cell injury. We also discussed hypoxia, the common causes of hypoxia, and gave an overview about the different mechanisms of cell injury. In this video, we will discuss those different mechanisms of cell injury in detail and then we will discuss about reversible and irreversible cell injury. Okay? So, what were the mechanisms of cell injury? As you can see, I have drawn in the board, there is a lot of mechanism that can cause cell injury. Say, for example, ATP depletion, mitochondrial damage, increased calcium entry, reactive oxygen species, membrane damage, and misfolded protein. All these mechanisms can cause cell injury, and we will discuss these mechanisms one by one. So, the first mechanism by which cell injury can occur was by ATP depletion. And I have also drawn a flowchart to explain. Let me give you an explanation. Say, for example, there was ischemia in a blood vessel. That means blood flow was reduced in a blood vessel. It may be due to some thrombus or some other occlusion. So when blood supply is reduced to that tissue, what's happening there? Oxygen supply is getting low, that is known as hypoxia, reduced amount of oxygen in the tissue. Then what happens when there is hypoxia, the electron transport chain cannot function properly because oxygen was used as an electron acceptor in the electron transport chain. So there will be um, less ATP synthesis from the electron transport chain and when there will be less ATP synthesis that will cause mainly three phenomena. The first thing is we need ATP, we need energy to survive, you know. So when there is um, absence of oxygen, the cells of our body will try to generate ATP without oxygen. That is known as a process, anaerobic um, respiration. Okay, and in that process, they will make some byproduct. One of the byproduct is known as lactic acidosis lactic acid and that will cause lactic acidosis. So when there is acid in the environment, the pH will drop and as a result of that drop in the pH, the chromatin material inside the cell will begin to clump. So that is the mechanism of ATP depletion resulting in cell injury. But that's not all. When there is ATP depletion, different um, pumps in our body will not function properly. One of these important pumps was the sodium pump. The function of sodium pump was to pump sodium out in exchange of uh, potassium. Okay, that, that was the function of sodium potassium pump. So now since we have less ATP, that pump will not work properly and as a result what will happen? Sodium will try sodium will um, accumulate in our cells and not only sodium uh, water will also accumulate and that will result in something called cell swelling similar mechanism will be also seen in the endoplasmic reticulum and that will result in endoplasmic reticulum swelling and there will be one thing one more thing when the cells are um, getting very swelled up you know, a lot of cell has microvilli, you know, this uh, finger-like uh, projection. So when the cell is getting really swelled up, those things will get lost. So there will be loss of microvilli. Okay, 
And um, the last uh, mechanism by which ATP depletion can cause cell injury is when the endoplasmic reticulum are getting swelled up. Remember, uh, do you know what is rough endoplasmic reticulum? Those are the endoplasmic reticulum with which ribosomes are attached. So when those rough endoplasmic reticulum are um, swelling up, what will happen? The ribosome which were attached with those um, endoplasmic reticulum, they will detach. Okay, and since ribosome is the site of protein synthesis, so there will be reduced amount of protein synthesis. Okay, so that is the first mechanism by which cell injury can occur. The second mechanism by which cell injury can occur is via mitochondrial damage. And uh, you can see that I have drawn a mitochondria here. Now, what is the function of mitochondria? Always remember, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, you know? The energy that is uh, needed for all the functions of cell in the form of ATP is generated on the inner membrane, you know? You can see mitochondria has an inner membrane and uh, it also has an outer membrane. So in the inner membrane, uh, those ATPs are generated, you know, via the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So whenever there is mitochondrial damage, one thing will happen, that is, the ATP production will get reduced. Okay, so that's uh, one thing. And uh, what other things can happen when there is uh, mitochondrial damage? Remember, when mitochondria are getting damaged, there is a formation of high conductance channel. That high conductance channel is known as mitochondrial permeability transition pore. Okay, this is very important for your MCQ. Mitochondrial permeability transition pore. This thing is produced when mitochondria are damaged. And what happens when that thing is produced? Um, the permeability of the mitochondrial membrane gets increased abnormally. And as a result, you know, mitochondria is, a, is an organelle and all the organelle has a special um, membrane potential. So, and that membrane potential will be lost because of the mitochondrial permeability trans transition pore. Okay, so the mitochondria will lose its membrane potential and as a result, it won't be able to produce sufficient amount of ATP. Okay, so that is the first mechanism by which uh, mitochondrial damage can cause cell injury. The second mechanism by which mitochondrial damage can cause cell injury is via apoptosis. Always remember between the inner membrane and the outer membrane of mitochondria there are a lot of proteins. You know I have drawn those proteins like these red dots and they can activate an important enzyme known as caspase which is important for apoptosis. Say for example here is a protein named cytochrome C. When mitochondria is damaged, when mitochondrial permeability transition pores are present, these proteins that were present between the inner membrane and outer membrane of mitochondria, they may leak out of the mitochondria. Okay, and they may come in the cytosol and there they can uh, stimulate certain enzymes and that can result in a special type of cell death that is known as apoptosis okay uh, which is also known as programmed cell death or suicide of the cell okay so we will come to that later so that was the mechanism by which mitochondrial damage can cause cell injury 
The next mechanism of cell injury is via increased cytosolic calcium. Always remember that calcium is an important mediator for cell injury and to prevent cell injury the calcium level inside the cytosol of the cell is always kept extremely low less than 0.1 micromole compared to the 1.3 millimole level of calcium outside the cell and calcium level is kept low inside the cytosol by sequestering calcium inside mitochondria and also inside the endoplasmic reticulum and sarcoplasmic reticulum okay so what happens when a cell is injured say via ischemia or by some toxin though those calcium that was um, that were sequestered inside the endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria they get released and also later when the cell is severely injured there is some pump failure and so calcium from the outside also uh, gets inside the cell there is also influx of calcium but that happens later initially after uh, being exposed to ischemia or after being exposed to toxin calcium level increases inside the cell as a result of release of calcium that was sequestered inside the mitochondria and also inside the endoplasmic reticulum and later calcium from outside also influx and causes high level of calcium inside the cell so what will happen then two things will happen one thing is this high level of calcium will increase the mitochondrial permeability transition pore and result in cell injury okay remember that there are some other causes that can cause mitochondrial damage besides high cytosolic calcium and they are reactive oxygen species and hypoxia this is important for your mcq what are the causes of mitochondrial damage increase cytosol calcium reactive oxygen species and hypoxia okay now coming back to the mechanism of cell injury by calcium entry the second way by which calcium can cause cell injury is by activating different types of enzymes and causing cell injury so what are the enzymes that are activated by um, calcium the first one is ATPase and it will um, break ATP and result in ATP depletion. The second enzyme activated by high level of calcium is phospholipase and uh, we know that phospholipid is an important component of our membrane so that will result in membrane breakdown. The third enzyme activated by calcium is protease and the name is uh, easy to understand that this enzyme will break down different types of protein inside our cell and cause cell injury and the fourth enzyme activated by high level of calcium is endonuclease and that will result in DNA damage okay so this is the mechanism by which cell injury occurs by increase calcium entry the fourth mechanism by which cell injury can occur is via reactive oxygen species now what is reactive oxygen species reactive oxygen species are oxygen derived free radicals but then you will ask me then what is free radicals and this is important you have to know the definition of free radicals free radicals are special type of molecule that have an unpaired electron in their outer orbit okay so the criteria of calling a molecule free radical is that they has to have a single unpaired electron in their outer orbit and 
this structure is not stable at all this is a very unstable structure and therefore the free radicals always tend to react with whatever they come in contact with that can be carbohydrate protein lipid uh, etc okay so that is free radical and um, they can cause cell injury now one important point that you have to remember about free radicals is that sometimes they can be autocatalytic that is when the free radicals are reacting with carbohydrate protein or lipid they can convert those carbohydrate protein or lipid into free radicals themselves and that will result in chain reaction so now we will discuss what are the causes of free radical formation there is five cause five main cause by which free radicals can be generated the first cause of free radical generation is via the normal reduction and oxidation reaction that occurs during different metabolic process inside our cell during molecular respiration let me give you a, an example oxygen during the this molecular respiratory process oxygen gets reduced and transfers four electron to hydrogen and forms two molecule of water okay so that is the normal reaction but sometimes there is partial reduction of oxygen and that will result in formation of some free radicals for example when one electron is transported there will be formation of a free radical which is known as superoxide anion and that is written like this so this is a free radical due to transfer of one electron instead of four the second free radical that can be produced is hydrogen peroxide h2o2 here there is transfer of two electron instead of four the third example is hydroxyl ion due to transfer of three electron instead of four so all these things are produced due to partial um, reduction okay but uh, normally these things are produced in a small amount and the cells have some um, antioxidant say for example vitamin a vitamin c vitamin e you know remember the term ace a c e vitamin a c e these are the antioxidants and uh, um, they can neutralize those um, free radicals when they are in small number and when they cannot neutralize when due to some reason there is high amount of these free radicals that results in a term known as oxidative stress so that was the first mechanism of formation of free radicals the second mechanism by which free radicals can be produced is via ionizing radiation okay that can be due to x-ray ultraviolet light etc the third mechanism by which free radicals can be produced occurs during inflammation okay during inflammation some cells in our body can make reactive oxygen species in high amount which is a term known as uh, reactive oxygen species burst and they use those reactive oxygen species mainly H2O2 and HOCl- which is a uh, potent bactericidal agent to destroy harmful organisms okay so that is um, the another mechanism of forming free radicals okay the fourth mechanism of forming free radical is uh, during metabolism of some exogenous molecules say for example carbon tetrachloride CCl4 uh, during its metabolic process can 
produce something like this, CCl3, and that is a potent free radical. Okay? And the last way, the fifth mechanism of forming um, free radical is um, via some metal. Okay? So there are some important um, metal in our cells. They are known as uh, transition metals, which include iron and also copper. Okay, and uh, they can produce free radicals. And always remember, there is an important uh, reaction that you may have heard in your biochemistry um, classes, and that was known as Fenton reaction. Do you recall? Fenton reaction, okay. Fenton. So, um, this reaction um, can occur inside our cell and the way that reaction occurs is hydrogen peroxide combines with iron that was in ferrous form that means Fe2 plus and uh, they make Fe3 plus and also they make these okay so that was uh, known as Fenton reaction and always remember most of the iron in our body is in the ferric form not in the ferrous form then how do we make this reaction first we can use some other uh, molecule mainly superoxide anion to convert ferrous into to convert ferric into ferrous ion and then we can uh, proceed in this reaction okay so that was the fifth mechanism of forming um, free radicals by using some transition metals say for example via Fenton reaction okay so now that we have known how free radicals are formed you may be asking so what is the mechanism of cell injury by free radical formation and I have uh, written three points you can see reactive oxygen species or free radicals can cause three problem the first thing is they can oxidize lipid say for example um, we know in our cell membrane we have a lot of lipid right and what happens um, when those lipids are oxidized they form peroxidase and those peroxidase containing membrane um, they get disrupted okay so um, that is the mechanism of lipid peroxidation and that will disrupt the membrane and remember lipid membrane not only found in the cell membrane but also in the membranes of different organelle so all those things will be affected the second mechanism by which free radicals can cause injury is by um, oxidation of the proteins say for example enzymes you know enzymes are also proteins so whenever some enzymes are oxidized they will lose their uh, enzymatic activity and sometimes there will be abnormal folding and uh, that will result in cell injury okay and the last mechanism by which a uh, reactive oxygen species can ca cause cell injury is by DNA damage okay so uh, they will cause mutation in the DNA and those um, due to oxidation and when those oxidized mutated uh, DNA breaks down that will cause cell injury okay so that was the mechanism of cell injury by reactive oxygen species the next mechanism of cell injury was via membrane damage okay now remember we have membrane in our cell which is the cell membrane and also in different organelles and they can be damaged so what are the common causes of membrane damage we have already discussed most of the causes of membrane damage one important cause is hypoxia okay so whenever we are having decreased oxygen in the tissue 
there will be ATP depletion and we have discussed that before and when there is ATP depletion that will result in decreased phospholipid synthesis and that will result in membrane damage. The other mechanism of cell membrane or other membrane damages via increase calcium in the cytosol. Recall that increased level of calcium uh, has a lot of effect in case of mitochondria that used to um, cause formation of mitochondrial transition mitochondrial permeability transition pore and that used to result in mitochondrial damage can you recall yes and another thing the uh, increase calcium in the cytosol did was it activated different enzymes say for example phospholipase protease endonuclease and atpase and among the four enzymes the first two phospholipase and protease are responsible for membrane damage let me explain the enzyme phospholipase will break down phospholipid that is the important component of the membrane and that will result in membrane damage but how does protease cause membrane damage protease breaks down cytoskeletal protein and do you know the function of cytoskeletal protein the function of cytoskeletal protein is to act as anchoring molecule and they uh, anchors the cell membrane or other membrane with the cell itself so whenever we are having protease causing cytoskeletal protein damage those uh, anchoring molecules uh, will get reduced in number and the cell membrane will become detached from the cell as we have seen in case of ischemia in myocardial cell and when those cells swell that will uh, cause rupture of the cell membrane okay so those were the common two causes of membrane damage hypoxia and increase cytosolic calcium however there are some other causes written in your textbook the other causes of membrane damage include bacterial toxin viral protein lytic complement component uh, etc even reactive oxygen species can cause membrane damage okay so the last mechanism by which cell injury can occur is via misfolded protein and DNA damage. Now recall that proteins are synthesized in the ribosome but after being synthesized they fold themselves in different three-dimensional architecture. Okay, but sometimes those foldings occur abnormally either due to some problem um, in the genes responsible for those protein okay so what will happen those misfolded protein containing cells cannot function properly and they will get injured and they will die okay and uh, sometimes uh, there may be some mutation in those cells or sometimes there may be uh, damage to DNA due to some exogenous reason and what will happen the cells that containing um, that contains those damaged DNA they will die via a programmed cell death mechanism known as apoptosis okay so that that was the last mechanism by which cell injury can occur so now that we have discussed the different mechanisms of cell injury now we will discuss another important topic and that is reversible and irreversible cell injury so what do we mean by reversible cell injury if an injured cell can return to normalcy after the injurious agent or injurious stimuli has been removed then that is known as reversible cell injury however if the injury was persistent or if the injury was extensive then 
even after we remove the injurious stimuli, the injured cell may not return to normalcy and eventually that cell will die. And that type of injury is known as irreversible cell injury. Now one interesting thing written in your textbook regarding reversible and irreversible cell injury is about the point of no return. That is the point when a cell that was reversibly damaged now becomes irreversibly damaged and now will die. That point of no return or that cutoff point is still uncertain or unclear. However, we do know some important morphological findings that are seen in reversible and irreversible cell injury. So we will discuss those things now briefly. Always remember the hallmark of reversible cell injury is two things cellular swelling and fatty change. Cellular swelling and fatty change. Now I'm sure you can uh, guess why there will be cellular swelling because remember uh, during cell injury mechanism number one we talked about ATP depletion that resulted in pump failure. As a result of pump failure there was influx of sodium along water and they caused what? They caused um, cell swelling, right? Okay. So that is the mechanism of cell swelling of the um, reversible cell injury. The next important hallmark of reversible cell injury is fatty change. There will be presence of some lipid um, particle in the cytoplasm of these reversibly um, damaged cell. However, this fatty change finding is mainly seen on cells that are either involved in fat metabolism or dependent on fat metabolism. Examples of uh, cells where you can see fatty change of reversible cell injury include the liver hepatocyte and the cardiac uh, myocardium. Okay? So um, those were the important hallmarks of um, reversible cell injury. Now what will we see in light microscope? Okay, now one thing you have to know that um, it is very difficult to um, see the reversible cell injury in light microscope. If a lot of cells are involved in that area, then that part of tissue will give a pale appearance, there will be swelling and the weight of the organ will, it will be increased. Okay, and uh, we will see some ultra-structural finding of uh, reversible cell injury. They will include um, mitochondrial swelling and sometimes there will be presence of some amorphous um, substance on the mitochondria. The other ultra-structural finding of reversible cell injury um, are endoplasmic reticulum swelling. There may be detachment of the ribosome from the endoplasmic reticulum and there may be some nuclear change. So as you can see in the picture, this is a normal cell. This is the nucleus of that normal cell and these three things I have drawn are endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and one thing you have to uh, notice, look at these red dots. I hope you can see them. These red dots that you can see on the endoplasmic reticulum they are representing ribosome okay so these are um, endoplasmic reticulum with ribosome and um, these are the mitochondria and these are the lysosomes so this is a normal cell now look what happens when that thing when that cell is reversibly injured notice that there is swelling of the endoplasmic reticulum Okay, and there will be also swelling of the mitochondria. And also there may be presence of some amorphous substance inside the mitochondria. Okay, so I'm drawing those things as black. So these are the ultra-structural finding of reversible cell injury. Mitochondrial swelling, endoplasmic reticulum swelling, some change in the nucleus, 
And what are these things? Can you see these things? They are like bubbles. They are uh, bleeding uh, out of the cell due to uh, increased amount of fluid inside the cell. Okay, so these are the uh, blebs. They are also seen in reversible cell injury. Now, similarly, regarding irreversible cell injury, we have two important phenomena that can be seen in irreversible cell injury. These two phenomena are, number one, inability to reverse the mitochondrial damage. Okay, so that's the first uh, point about irreversible cell injury. And the second point about uh, irreversible cell injury is there will be profound dysfunction in the membrane either the cell membrane or the membrane of the lysosome or other organelle okay so these are the important findings of reversible and irreversible cell injury so irreversible cell injury can be of two types necrosis or apoptosis so we will discuss about necrosis now so how can we define necrosis? Okay, now don't get scared. The definition of necrosis is long, but once you understand the definition, you will find this very easy. So as written in your textbook, necrosis can be defined as a spectrum of morphological changes that follow cell death in living tissue. Why? Due to progressive degradative action of enzyme on lethally injured cells okay so uh, always uh, remember when you try to memorize a big definition look for keywords to remember the definition so regarding the definition of necrosis what is the first keyword this is not a single thing this is a spectrum you know this is a range that means uh, necrosis is a uh, spectrum, it's a range, not a single um, event. So, this is a spectrum of morphological changes. Now, where is this thing happening? This thing is happening in living tissue, but this will result in cell death. Okay, so, spectrum of morphological changes that follow cell death in um, living tissue and why is this thing happening it's happening due to the destructive action of enzyme on the damaged cell like I said here necrosis can be defined as a spectrum of morphologic changes that follow cell death in living tissue due to progressive degradative action of enzyme on lethally injured cells okay so that is necrosis the next point that we have to know regarding necrosis is the morphology of necrosis okay before going to that uh, regarding the enzyme we said that uh, the enzyme uh, destroys the cells and those things result in necrosis but uh, uh, a question may be asked from here that where does this enzyme come from the enzyme can come from the damaged cell itself you know during cell injury we have uh, discussed earlier that uh, there is a membrane damage so the membrane of the lysosome are also getting damaged and becoming leaky and uh, the lysosomal enzymes enzymes can then uh, leak out uh, from the cell okay and if the enzymes responsible for necrosis uh, derived from the damaged cell itself then that is known as autolysis and sometimes uh, the enzymes come from uh, inflammatory cells like uh, neutrophil or other inflammatory cell which came at the site of injury to give us protection and in that case um, that is called heterolysis okay so we may be asked this in your exam what is autolysis and what is heterolysis okay so now let's uh, uh, go further and now we will discuss the morphology of necrosis okay so uh, what will we see in um, 
under microscope regarding necrosis. The first thing we will see is there will be increase um, uh, regarding the cytoplasm. Okay, so I will talk about first uh, the cytoplasmic change and then we will talk about the nuclear change. So in the cytoplasm, there will be increased eosinophilia. Okay, uh, always remember that uh, we can stain these slides by H and E stain, that is hematoxylin and eosin stain. It contains two stain. One is hematoxylin, the other one is eosin. Okay, and the color that eosin uh, gives is uh, pink or you can say a uh, reddish color. Okay, and the color that the hematoxylin will give is a bit bluish. Okay, so what did I say? In necrosis there is increase eosinophilia and the result and that results from the fact um, that in necrosis there is denaturation of protein and eosin can bind strongly with those denaturated protein and that will result in eosinophilia moreover as we will uh, discuss in case of necrosis there is um, loss of nuclear material and always remember the cytoplasmic RNA used to bind strongly with hematoxylin dye and that gave the basophilia or the bluish color so now since uh, in necrosis the nuclear material uh, no longer exists so there will be decreased basophilia so the combined effect of increased eosinophilia and decreased basophilia uh, will give us an eosinophilic um, slide. The next thing is uh, during necrosis there will be enzymatic uh, degradation and there will be uh, a lot of vacuoles formed inside the cell cytoplasm and you will hear about a term that is called moth-eaten appearance because inside the cytoplasm there will be a lot of vacuoles and sometimes they will fuse with one another and that will give an appearance as if this part was eaten by some insect moth eaten appearance of the cytoplasm so the first finding of cytoplasm of a necrosis cell was increased eosinophilia the second finding we said moth eaten appearance the third finding is the cytoplasm will become more glossy and homogeneous in appearance okay that is due to decreased amount of glycogen so uh, those were the nuclear finding uh, those were the cytoplasmic finding of necrosis and now we will talk about the nuclear findings of necrosis so you will see in your textbook that we see mainly three things the first thing is the nucleus of the cell becomes shrinked and condensed and when that thing is condensed the nucleus used to bind with um, hematoxylin and that gave basophilic color so the basophilia will initially increase because the nucleus is getting shrinked and condensed and so that will uh, become a uh, thing known as pycnosis the nuclear material is condensed into a basophilic pycnotic mass the next uh, nuclear finding that we will see in a necrosis cell is there will be a fragmentation of that pycnotic nucleus. Okay, so here you can see the nuclear fragment has been, uh, the nucleus has been fragmented and this is known as karyorexis. And the last nuclear finding that we will see in necrosis is karyolysis. So the first finding where the nucleus shrinked was pycnosis. The second finding where the nuclear became, became uh, fragmented was known as karyorexis. And the last finding is karyolysis where the nucleus fades away. And uh, you will see a term that is the basophilia of the nucleus fades away. So at the end of the necrosis we will see cells that won't have any nucleus in it okay so now that we have discussed the 
morphology of necrosis now we will discuss the types of necrosis and always remember there are mainly two basic types of necrosis the first one is coagulative necrosis and the second one is liquefactive necrosis so what do we mean by coagulative necrosis in this type of necrosis the cells are dead but the outline and architecture of the cells are preserved at least for a few days and the reason for that is here the main cause of cell injury is via denaturation of protein and during denaturation of protein not only the structural proteins are getting denaturated but also different enzymes inside the cell are also getting denaturated and as a result of that there is no enzyme <clears throat> inside the cell to digest the cells so the architecture the outline are preserved so that is known as coagulative necrosis so what are the examples of coagulative necrosis remember um, ischemic injury in all organ except brain will result in coagulative necrosis okay so always remember that ischemia in any organ except brain will result in coagulative necrosis but if there is ischemia in brain or hypoxia in brain that will result in liquefactive necrosis and we will explain their cause later so the next basic type of necrosis uh, is liquefactive necrosis and what is happening here here the cells are getting severely damaged not by denaturation of protein but by enzymatic degradation you know enzyme either via autolysis that i said before or heterolysis is digesting the entire damaged area and making it making it liquid okay so examples of liquefactive necrosis include um, abscess and also like i said um, hypoxic injury in the brain will result in liquefactive necrosis now why well one um, reason for which there may be liquefactive necrosis in the brain is uh, because in the brain we have a lot of microglial cell and they contain a lot of enzymes okay so that may be a cause of liquefactive necrosis in the brain okay so besides the two basic type of necrosis that i just said coagulative necrosis and liquefactive necrosis there are some other important necrosis that you have to know so some other important necrosis include gangrenous necrosis caseous necrosis fat necrosis and fibrinoid necrosis and we will discuss these things briefly so first is gangrenous necrosis now this term is usually used for the limbs or mainly the lower limbs when there is um, decreased blood supply in the lower limb that can result in uh, this type of damage which is known as gangrene and uh, sometimes there is bacterial infection superimposed on this gangrenous necrosis so uh, normally the gangrenous necrosis is a coagulative type of necrosis but whenever there is bacterial infection superimposed the um, harmful agents released by the bacteria and also the enzymes that were released by the inflammatory cells that came to um, help this uh, affected part all those things result in liquefactive necrosis and then the term is wet gangrene okay so always keep that in mind gangrene dry gangrene and when there is liquefactive necrosis we call it wet gangrene the next important uh, type of necrosis is caseous necrosis and the word caseous means cheese like and the name came from the fact that this type of necrosis there is a white friable area caseous necrosis is usually seen in tuberculosis and uh, there is a term known as granuloma the 
central part of the granuloma. If I can draw a granuloma, you can see, I'm drawing that thing briefly, the central part contains caseous necrosis and uh, that thing will be surrounded by different inflammatory cells and epithelial cell. Okay, so these were epithelial cell and I'm now drawing uh, lymphocyte, you can see these are inflammatory cell and also sometimes there may be giant cell. Okay, so this is an example of caseous necrosis that is seen in tuberculosis. The next type of necrosis um, is fat necrosis. Okay, so the commonest cause of fat necrosis is acute pancreatitis and what happens in acute pancreatitis is remember pancreas contains lipase you know but uh, those lipase are not released inside the pancreas via the pancreatic duct they uh, go into the uh, intestine and there they help in fat digestion but when there is acute pancreatitis those lipase are get released inside the pancreas or um, around the pancreas okay and that results in um, fat necrosis and um, sometimes those lipase they break down triglyceride into fatty acid and when calcium binds with that fatty acid um, that results in something called fat saponification and that will result in a chalky white appearance of those affected area so always look for this buzzword chalky white appearance that is indicating fat saponification that means there has been calcification of the fatty acid that means there was fat necrosis the last uh, type of uh, necrosis that i will talk about is fibrinoid necrosis Fibrinoid means like fibrin. What happens here is this type of necrosis is usually seen in the blood vessels during some immune immunological diseases. What happens? Antigen and antibody complex gets deposited in the blood vessel and they result in cell injury and um, then the fibrin leaks out of the blood vessel and uh, that gives a pink appearance of the um, surroundings of the blood vessel under hematoxylin and eosin stain as if there was a fibrin deposition okay so uh, fibrin like so that is the fibrinoid necrosis okay so that is uh, all about um, necrosis in short regarding the last type of irreversible cell injury that is apoptosis um, well apoptosis is a very long topic so I will try to make a video exclusively on apoptosis uh, hopefully within a week uh, when I get some free time but to conclude the discussion here remember always remember that apoptosis and necrosis are very different apoptosis is a type of programmed cell death what is happening in apoptosis the cells which decide that they will kill themselves they um, activate some enzymes and those enzymes uh, one of which is caspase is a very important um, enzyme there um, they result in destruction of the DNA and nuclear and cytoplasmic protein of those cells and there are some gross difference between apoptosis and necrosis and say for example um, the cell size in case of necrosis gets increased remember there was cell swelling and in apoptosis the cell size gets uh, reduced because in apoptosis there is cell shrinkage um, regarding the nuclear change we have talked about the nuclear change of necrosis which included pycnosis that was the condensation of the nucleus then there was karyorexis that means fragmentation of that pycnotic nucleus and then there was karyolysis and uh, in the nuclear change of apoptosis there may be formation of nucleosomes okay 
Uh, another important and very high yield uh, point regarding the difference between apoptosis and necrosis is uh, in necrosis there may be membrane damage but always remember the cell membrane regarding apoptosis the membranes remain intact there is no membrane damage uh, in apoptosis okay and the last point is the cause of necrosis may be the cause of necrosis is always pathological but the cause of apoptosis may be pathological as well as physiological okay so we will talk more about apoptosis hopefully within a week or two and uh, so this concludes our second part of the cell injury video um, I hope you will go through your textbooks and uh, look at different uh, images of histopathology slides and uh, flowcharts so that's all for today I hope this was helpful Take care. Thank you.